You are the sum of every covenant promise, telling of the peace between God and man. Within you, every single thing is held together. So why am I still trying to save myself again? You are the substance of my faith and my redemption. Oh, and ever present help in time of need. In the midst of condemnation, I'm astounded to hear the cross has spoken freedom.
Welcome to Family Church at Home. I'm Blake. We're excited that you're gathering with us today here at Family Church. We want to welcome you in like family. So if you live in the Palm Beach County or the Treasure Coast, visit one of our neighborhood churches near you. Plan your visit today at GoFamilyChurch.org. We would love to meet you in person next Sunday. Now, we're going to sing songs to God and later hear a teaching from God's Word. Our prayer is that you have a great encounter with Jesus today through songs we're about to sing and the teaching of God's Word. Let's open our hearts and our minds for worship. In Jesus' name this morning, amen. Amen. Good morning, Family Church. Good morning, Family Church at home. Hey, why don't we stand to our feet as we begin to worship our God in response to, to His grace, to the blessings that He's blessed us with. Amen. Let's sing together. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. Try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, yeah, a vagabond. Sing this out with me. And just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Turn me around and place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Yeah. Put your hands together, church. I cannot deny what I see. No choice but to believe my doubts are burning, yeah, like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. What were their names? Burden and bitterness. You can just keep them moving, yeah. Now you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk streets of gold. I sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my name. I thank the Savior, I thank God, yeah. We thank you, Father. Come on, let's sing this together. Sing, hell oh, lost another one. I am free, I am free, I am free. We believe. Hell oh, lost another one. church. Hey Family Church, I'm Blake and I'm an intern at Family Church Sherbrooke. And I'm Ella. I'm an intern at Family Church Downtown. I hope that you're having a great summer so far. We're looking ahead to August and we have a lot of exciting events coming up this fall. 
Parents of upcoming sixth graders, August 5th is our sixth grade milestone event where you and your new student can hear about the culture of student ministry. Starting at 12 o'clock p.m. in the Treasure Coast at Family Church North Stewart and at 6 p.m. in Palm Beach County at Family Church Gardens. Back to School Sunday is on August 6th at your neighborhood church. We are going to start the school year off right and pray for our kids, students, school administrators, and educators as they embark on this new school year. Leadership Rally Live to Bless is less than a month away on August 13th. Enjoy the family reunion at 5 p.m. at Family Church Downtown. RSVP on your Connect card today. You were designed for community. Group Connect is coming to your neighborhood church on August 20th. Plan to stop by and connect with a group leader to find the best group for you. And to wrap up the month of August, we will be hosting seven days of prayer at your neighborhood church from August 21st through 27th at 6 o'clock a.m. You can stay up to date with all the latest information by scanning the QR code on your listening guide to stay connected with the family. Last week, we had over 500 students and adults at student camp. Each middle and high school student participated in small groups to strengthen their faith through the studying of God's word, fellowship, and gospel conversations. So I've been coming to camp now for six years. And when we come here, uh, everybody's super excited. They're, they're ready to play, they're ready to have fun, they're ready to have all these games and activities. But then the coolest part about it is uh, we step into the worship center for the first time. And uh, you know immediately and they know immediately why they're here. The first note is strums uh, and the hands go up and they're worshiping Christ. And the coolest part about that is, and it's been burned into my mind every single year, has been to look around the room and watch these kids worship and know why they're here and the true reason why they came to camp. One of the most impactful things for our students is just seeing how they are just excited and building off of one another, just the excitement in worship and in the word of God and, uh, and just sharing what he's done in their lives. And that's just been so impactful for us as camp mom and dads, my wife and I. Um, it's just been a breath of fresh air this week, uh, a great and fun and busy week, but to see these kids encouraged in good company with one another. Uh, and that's what it's all about. I think the most impactful thing that's happened at camp so far has just been seeing my girls open up about, um, you know, what God's doing in their lives and um, just seeing them take steps to be closer to him and being able to have those conversations uh, has been a blessing to me. Camp has been so great just seeing all my girls just come out of their shells, make relationships and allowing Jesus to be the one to carry their sins and their shame and just bring that to the light and just see them really just enjoy all the messages. Thank you for praying for the hard transformation of each student at camp. The change of pace and change of place really leads to a change of heart. When you give to Relentless Pursuit, you partner with us to build families. Give online at gofamilychurch.org slash give or at your neighborhood church to disciple and encourage the next generation of leaders. Now let's go worship our King Jesus. Well, good morning, Family Church. So good to be with you this morning. We're gonna move into our time of worship through giving. So if you're seated on the far left-hand side of each row, you can grab that bucket, pass it towards the right, and an usher will be by to pick it up. We're also gonna continue in worship through music. So for now, we ask you to remain seated, and I'll stand you up in just a second. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his head, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart, no tongue can bid me why don't you stand, let's sing together. When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an heirs of all my 
to be crucified for our sins and that you raised him from the dead proving your infallible power. And God, I thank you for all the lives in this room that have been changed by Jesus. But now, God, we know that there are people in the room that have tremendous burdens, cares, frustrations, bitterness, anger, griefs. And God, we lay all these before you and we're asking you to meet with us right now as we open your word. Would you Speak to us. Would you give us open ears and open eyes and open hearts? Let us receive what you have to say by your spirit. God, we need your comfort. We need your courage. And we know you're going to give it to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. Welcome again to Family Church. My name is Jimmy Scroggins. I'm one of the pastors here. I normally teach the Bible here on this platform at Family Church downtown. If you're new to Family Church, you've never been here before, welcome. I hope I get a chance to meet you face to face before you leave today. I, I would love to connect with you, put a face with a name, shake your hand, and get to know your name. Especially all the kids from our sister church at Christ Fellowship, thank you for showing the whole community what it looks like to truly be the body of Christ. Because even though we attend different neighborhood churches, we really are a part of one church. That's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And let's give it up for our kids from CF. Awesome that you guys are here, really fantastic. Also, we just got back um, from camp. You know, you saw the video and uh, all of these students at our camp, kind of like what they're doing for their camp. We had hundreds of students, middle school and high school students with us at camp all week. And I want you to know, uh, I've been doing, going to camp for a long time. And in the 15 years that I've been the pastor here, that is the greatest week of camp we've ever had at Family Church. We had more kids involved, more leaders involved, but it wasn't that. It was something about the Spirit of God just being present and active, and you could feel the Spirit of God moving among these teenagers. Now, these are not perfect teenagers. They have, they have a life, okay? They're, they're the real deal, and yet you can sense the Spirit of God moving among our teenagers. I'll tell you what happened. A lot of kids are overwhelmed with what I call a sin, blame, guilt, and shame. They're just overwhelmed by it. It's heavy on their hearts. 
Uh, they have fun, but then when they think about it, sin, blame, guilt, and shame is just weighing them down. It's on their minds all the time. And some of it's because of decisions that they've made in their young lives, and they feel bad about that. Some of it's because of decisions that other people have made, things that other people have even done to them that are not their fault, and yet they carry around all of this sin and blame and guilt and shame. And it was awesome to see some of our kids begin to get delivered from that and begin to get free from that. But what I know is it's not just kids that feel that way. A lot of adults in this room have come this morning and the truth is you are overwhelmed in your own inner sense of guilt, blame, sin, and shame because of decisions that you've made or sins that others have committed that have splattered onto you and it just weighs you down. And it makes you wonder if you can really be everything that God wants you to be. And I want you to know that God loves you and Jesus died on the cross for your sin, blame, guilt, and shame and that you can be delivered and set free. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about this morning, how God can rescue us from sin, blame, guilt, and shame. So if you have your Bibles, let's have our Bible study right now. Open it up to the New Testament. Turn your Bibles on, reach into the pew in front of you and get a Bible and open it up to the Gospel of Luke chapter four. The Gospel of Luke chapter four. At Family Church, at all of our family churches all over South Florida, we are studying through the Gospel of Luke for the next nine months. And we are on Luke chapter four. In just a moment, we're gonna read uh, from the middle of that chapter. I'd also encourage you to get your program out. We're gonna have a chance for you to write some things down. You should write things down when you have a Bible study so that you can remember them and talk about them uh, later. Before we read from our text of scripture though, there is something that happened back in 1976 that was before many of your time, was before my time too, to be honest with you. But in 1976, there was this thing called Operation Thunderbolt. Operation Thunderbolt. 1976, some Arab and German terrorists hijacked a commercial airplane with hundreds of passengers. They redirected the plane to Entebbe, Uganda. They landed the plane there in Africa and they were welcomed and protected by a ruthless dictator named Idi Amin and his soldiers. They landed at the airport in Entebbe and they immediately let all of the non-Jewish passengers go and they retained the Jewish passengers as hostages. They threatened to kill Jewish passengers if their unrealistic demands were not quickly met and everybody knows that Israel does not negotiate with terrorists and so those hostages were in that airport under the control of these terrorists and they knew that they were going to die because they were too far from Israel. There was no way Israel could come and rescue them. They were surrounded by Idi Amin soldiers. They, they were hostage, they were taken hostage by ruthless terrorists and they knew that they were going to die. They talked among themselves and they said, this is it. There's no way we can be rescued. Nobody's coming, we're, 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 we're going to die. What they didn't know was back in Israel, they were planning a rescue. And they put together one of the most daring and courageous and outlandish rescue plans in modern history. They loaded up these C-130 transport planes with special forces soldiers wearing Ugandan, uniform, Ugandan army uniforms. They flew under the radar 2,400 miles with or without permission from the countries they were flying over. They flew and they landed at the airport in Entebbe. They came out wearing uniforms of the Ugandan army and it confused everybody on the ground. And they went into the airport, attacked the airport, killed all the terrorists, killed a bunch of Idi Amin soldiers, rescued almost all of the hostages, only lost two soldiers, loaded them back onto those C-130s. The planes kept the engines running and they took off and rescued those hostages. And to this day, militaries and special forces around the world study what happened in 1976, Operation Thunderbolt, because it looked like there was no possibility of rescue, but a rescue was on the way. And they did it. It's a pretty incredible story. And that's exactly how those young people at camp felt, and that's exactly how some of you feel. You feel like you're trapped by your sin, blame, guilt, and shame. Not just the sins that you've committed, but maybe something that happened when you were growing up, maybe something that happened with your parents, or your spouse, or your ex, or whatever it is. You feel trapped by sin, blame, guilt, and shame, and you feel like there's no way out. You feel like there's nobody coming for you. This is just it for you. And yet God has sent a rescuer, his son Jesus, to be crucified on the cross for our sins and to be raised from the dead so that we can be delivered from sin, blame, guilt, 
and shame. That's the whole point of the whole thing. And we're gonna read this story this morning, and this text I'm going to read is a story about Jesus preaching a sermon in a synagogue. Jesus stands up and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. He preaches a one-line short sermon and sits down. They do some Q&A. The people in the audience don't like his answers, and so they decide to murder him. That's the story for the day. Now, I've been preaching here a long time, 15 years, almost every Sunday. I've preached well over 700 sermons in this room on Sunday mornings over the last decade and a half. From time to time, I do get emails from people who don't like something that I said on a Sunday. I also occasionally have people greet me in the lobby and communicate that they didn't appreciate something that I said in my sermon that day. But in 15 years, no one has actually tried to murder me at the end of my sermons. And I just wanna keep that streak alive. Can we do that? Can we let that streak live? Let's go ahead and read Luke chapter four about the sermon that Jesus preached in the synagogue. Luke chapter four, starting in verse 14, here's what the word of God says. And, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. He paused like there. Let's do a little analysis of just that kind of opening paragraph. It says that Jesus went there by the power of the Spirit. If you've been following along in the book of Luke, you remember that when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and that was a visible sign of the Spirit of God landing on Jesus. You remember last week we talked about the temptation of Jesus in the desert. The Bible says, St. Luke writes, that the Spirit of God led him out into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And now the Spirit of God is leading him back to Galilee, to Nazareth, to the synagogue so that he can teach. And he's teaching very, very powerfully. He goes back to Galilee. You say, well, where's Galilee? Well, look at modern day Israel. You can see where Jerusalem is, kind of in the south. And he was from Galilee in the north. That's the Sea of Galilee. There you see the whole region. The Galilee was kind of like uh, the redneck region of Israel. It's kind of out in the boonies. It's kind of out in the sticks. If you were from Galilee, you were considered to be a very unsophisticated, sort of a blue collar uh, person. And that's where Jesus was from. Some of you next year, we're gonna take a trip to Israel. We're gonna take people from Family Church, Pastor Bernie and I are. If you wanna go with us, we'll go to Galilee. We'll go to the Sea of Galilee. We'll see, we'll stand on the, the sand where Jesus stood to do some of these uh, teachings. But this is a real place, and this is where Jesus was doing this teaching. Now, when Jesus gets there to teach at the, at the synagogue, he's very famous by now. His reputation is growing. He has paparazzi around him. People are trying to check it out. He's, he's super famous. And then he goes to this synagogue. Well, what's a synagogue? Well, during, uh, there was a time before Jesus was alive when the Jewish people were dispersed all over the world by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And when they would land in another city, like a Greek city or a Roman city that wasn't a traditional Jewish city, anytime they would collect at least 10 Jewish families in a town or a city, they would start what was called a synagogue. And the synagogue was just a place where they could hold on to their faith. They could gather, they, they could read from the Old Testament, they could talk about it, they could, they could hold their families together. They, they, they had these synagogues, and so that's what, and that was a pretty good strategy. It's kind of a strategy that we're following today, isn't it, at Family Church? I mean, we want to put a neighborhood pastor in a neighborhood building in a neighborhood church that speaks the neighborhood language. We want to start a neighborhood school, and we want to do it all over South Florida, everywhere that we can, where people can gather and teach the Bible and build their families and love their neighbors. Same strategy they were using with these synagogues. Well, St. Luke is highlighting the teaching and the preaching of Jesus, that's what made him famous. And this isn't the first time that Jesus went to the synagogue, the Bible says. He, he goes there all the time. It's his custom, maybe you noticed. And why is that important? Because you and I should be making, if we're gonna follow God, we're gonna be followers of Jesus, we need to make it our custom to gather with our church family on a regular basis, every week, as much as we can. We do that because if we're gonna be followers of Jesus, we have to follow his patterns. And one of his patterns was to make a custom of gathering with his family of faith. Now, what would happen when you got to the synagogue, uh, they'd get to the synagogue and someone would stand up 
and read from the law. That's the first five books of the Old Testament. And they would sit down and then someone would stand up and read from one of the prophets, which Jesus is about to read from Isaiah. And then they would invite somebody there to stand up and give a talk about the law and the prophetic text that had just been read. So Jesus opens up the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and here's what happens, verse 17, Luke chapter four. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the covering of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. We preach sermons about Jesus, but here we are reading in Luke chapter four, a story about Jesus preaching a sermon about Jesus. It's a very short sermon, it's one line. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And some of you are thinking, I wish you would preach a sermon as short as Jesus. I ain't Jesus. Let's keep reading, verse 22. All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. He did a bunch of miracles in this village called Capernaum. Verse 24, and he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. What can we learn from this text? What can we learn from this story? If you're writing things down, here's point number one. I'd encourage you to write this down. Number one, we can learn that Jesus is the big story of the Bible. Jesus is the big story of the Bible. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, all of the Old Testament stories point us to Jesus. All of the law points us to Jesus. All of the prophets point us to Jesus. All of the Psalms point us to Jesus. When you read the New Testament, all of the Gospels and all of the letters of Paul and all the other epistles from various apostles, all of those letters point us to Jesus. Everything in the Bible is the story of Jesus. That's why Jesus says in verse 21, they read from the law in the synagogue, he read from the prophet Isaiah, and he said, all of these scriptures are fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he's saying, I'm the one that all of this is about. And why would that be so shocking to his hearers? He, Jesus is reading from a scroll from what we would call Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, uh, you don't probably know a lot about it. Most of your minds are not rushing to the content of Isaiah 61. That's just like, okay, whatever. I'm sure it's really good. It is. But the Jewish people in the synagogue that day knew their Bibles a lot better than most of us. And so when he read part of Isaiah 61, they kind of knew the context of what he was referring to. Isaiah prophesied to the Jewish people back in 700 BC, 700 years before Jesus is reading this text. The first, so check this out. If you read the whole book of Isaiah, and it's super long, the first half of the book of Isaiah is about the judgment of God. Because the people of Israel who were supposed to worship only God and be faithful to God, they were unfaithful to God and they worshiped false gods. 
And while they were doing all of that, they did not treat poor people well. They took advantage of them. And they did not treat oppressed people well. They oppressed them more. And they just kind of pushed people to the margins. They began to use their authority, their power, their influence to push people down and push them out. And God didn't like that. That's not how God wants his people to treat people. And so the judgment of God was coming. And Isaiah prophesied, he said, What's, what God's gonna do in order to get your attention and to humble you, God is going to bring foreign armies and they're gonna invade your land and they're gonna humiliate you and humble you and defeat you. And then you're gonna give God your attention. That's the first half of the book of Isaiah. And that actually happened. The second half of the book of Isaiah though is different. The second half of the book of Isaiah is a message of hope. And the second half of the book of Isaiah, God is saying, hey, look, I am going to judge you and I'm gonna have to do what I have to do to get your attention because you won't give me your attention. You're too proud, you're too sinful, you're too rebellious, but I'm gonna get your attention. And when you give me your attention, then I'm going to send a rescuer. I'm promising I'm going to send a Messiah, a rescuer who will then make all the sad things come untrue. He's going he's gonna to overcome the judgment of God with the mercy and the love of God. He's going to restore all the things that have been lost. And even more than restore, he's going to make it, he's going to make it better. Now, let me just ask you a question. Don't you feel like you need someone to rescue you and deliver you from your own sin, blame, guilt, and shame? Don't you need someone to deliver you and release you from the burden from the regret, from the longing, from the depression, from the discouragement that comes from you carrying around sin, blame, guilt, and shame? Well, the people of Israel did too. That's what the prophet Isaiah is saying. Let me just read to you some of the other parts of Isaiah 61 that you probably don't know by heart, but the people in the synagogue, that they, they would have thought about these. Isaiah chapter 61 verse three says that when the rescuer comes, he's going to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. See, back in those days when they would be upset and they would be mourning or they lost a war, when something bad happened, they would take ashes and pile them on their head in order to show everybody how much grief they were involved in. But he says, instead of you having a symbol of grief on your head like ashes, he's going to put a beautiful headrest on you as a sign of rejoicing and satisfaction. When the rescuer comes, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 4, it says, they shall build up the ancient ruins and shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Do you feel like there are areas of your life or your family that have been devastated? Do you feel like there are areas of your own heart or your own psychology that have been ruined? And what the Bible says when the rescuer comes, he's going to put back together what has been broken. He's going to repair what has been devastated. That's what he comes to do. Don't you need that? Don't you want that? Doesn't your family need that? And he says, it's not just for you, it's for many generations. Don't you want the hearts of your children pulled back to God and pulled back to you? Don't you want the hearts of the children in our community pulled towards God. And that's why he says, when the, end, when the rescuer comes, he's not there to push people down. He's not there to push people out. He's there to pull people in. He's there to lift people up. That's what the rescuer is coming to do. And Jesus says today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Listen to what else he says in Isaiah chapter 61. When the rescuer comes, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. It's not God's will for you and for me to walk around carrying a bunch of sin, blame, guilt, and shame. That is not God's will. God is bringing us a double portion. Not, not just a single portion, a double portion of what he's coming to give us. What's he gonna give us a double portion of? I don't know, but if God's passing out portions, I'll take two like the word of God says, won't you? a double portion, and we'll have everlasting joy. And did you see in the text that Jesus did read? In your Bible, in the New Testament, it's in verse 19 of Luke chapter four. He said, the Messiah is gonna bring the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. That's a reference back to the law. Leviticus talks about what was called the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee in the book of Leviticus, the Old Testament book of the law, 
was a year that was supposed to come every 50 years to the nation of Israel. And in that year, everything reset, especially when it came to finances and ownership. So if you owed somebody money at year 50, when that year came, boom, debt's canceled. It's over, it's off your back. It's better than Joe Biden and the student debt, man. It cancels it all, just boom, it's all good. Don't, don't at me, don't at me. Some of you like it, some of you don't, I don't care. All right, I digress. You're the Lord's favor. Family land that had been lost through stupid business transactions or that had been taken through all kinds of shenanigans. Family inheritances are restored in the year of the Lord's favor, the year of a Jubilee. Slaves who had been enslaved because of their own economic uh, foibles and maybe someone had taken advantage of them. In the year of Jubilee, all the slaves are released. The debts are canceled, the slaves are released, the land is restored, the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus said, This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And he sat down. Man. Jesus reading all this stuff in his hometown synagogue and you see what they say. How can this scripture be fulfilled in our hearing by this guy? That's Joseph's son. He's grown up around here. Yeah, he's 30 years old now, but I remember when he was a kid, I taught him in elementary school. I coached him in Little League. I used to buy my furniture from his dad's carpenter shop. That's just Joseph's son. How is he saying that about himself? Because Jesus is saying, we're reading all this stuff and every bit of it is about me. Number two on your notes, Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Today, the scripture's fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is saying, I'm the one. Eventually, if you keep reading the Gospel of Luke, you find that Luke tells you that Jesus is crucified on the cross for the sins of the world. His dead body is buried. God raises him from the dead. The tomb is empty. And then Jesus ascends to heaven in the book of Acts that Luke also authored. Jesus is the one who God sent to save us from our sins. You know what that means? You know why that applies to sin, blame, guilt, and shame? When you are eating up with sin, blame, guilt, and shame, and that is weighing you down, and it is weighing down your heart, what you need is to be released from that, and how does that work? This is how it works. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, the Bible says God did a miracle. God took the sins of believers, your sins and my sins, off of us, our own sin, our guilt, our blame, and our shame, off of us, and he put it all on Jesus while he was on the cross. So that Jesus now is the one who is receiving the wrath of God in his own body on our behalf as our sacrifice, he pays the penalty for my sins and your sins because all of our guilt, blame, sin, and shame is taken off of us and put on him. And the Bible says when you become a believer, the Bible said describes it in one place like this. It's like the righteousness of Christ, because he never sinned, the righteousness of Christ is taken from him and given to you. So your sin, blame, guilt, and shame is on him. You don't have that anymore. His righteousness is taken off of him and put on you. The Bible says in the Old Testament, it's like God covers us with a blanket of righteousness. Man, when you've been eaten up with sin, blame, guilt, and shame your whole life, making one stupid decision after another, and this person sinned against you, and their sin splattered on you, and this happened to you, and it wasn't even your fault, but you feel horrible about it, and you've been carrying that around your whole life, doesn't it seem like it would be amazing if you could take all of that, all of it, off of your own heart, off of yourself, and just give it to Jesus because he can take it. But wouldn't it be great, instead of facing God, feeling horrible and unworthy and unlovable and unfaithful, if you could go to God saying, I don't have this sin, blame, guilt, and shame anymore. That's been taken care of at the cross. What I have now, God, I've got a blanket of righteousness on me. Not because I'm so good, because he gave it to me. Because he's so righteous. Man, that's the good stuff. That's why this is so powerful. Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's what he came to do. You say, well, wait a minute, Jimmy. He just said he's gonna like set captives free and make blind people see. What about all that? Okay, number three on your notes. Jesus is the rescue we need. Jesus is the rescue we need. When Jesus makes all these proclamations about that Isaiah's making, he says, I'm gonna do all that stuff. What would that have meant to the ears of first century Jews who are in the synagogue? When he starts talking about setting the captives free and the oppressed and the blind, what does that mean to them? 
Well, Jewish people back then were under this brutal Roman occupation. And the Romans were brutal to the wives, brutal to their children, brutal to their daughters. The Romans were brutal economically. They overtaxed them. They overworked them. They crucified them. They beat them. It's horrible. And so when you said that to a first century Jew, they're thinking immediately, you're going to deliver some oppressed people and some captives? Let's start by getting the Romans out of here. And they thought he would get the Romans out of here. They thought, oh, he must be about to establish a new kingdom of Israel, a free and independent state of Israel under the rulership of him as the king. It's kind of like what it was when David was our king. He must be going to reestablish that. But that really wasn't the deliverance that Jesus was talking about, at least not at that time. And what does that prophecy sound like to our ears? These verses are often used by various movements liberation movements, because Jesus is preaching indeed about liberation. Well, maybe it's telling us we should deal with things like social justice or racism or abuse or poverty, because those things are such a scourge on our society. And we should do all of that in Jesus' name. I'm for dealing with all of it. But these verses are not primarily talking about that. There are a lot of bad things in the world, and you may feel like there's a lot of bad things about the system. I'd be inclined to, to agree. But Jesus didn't come to save the system. Jesus came to save sinners. Je- Jesus didn't come to change the system. He came to change sinners. Now, if enough sinners get changed, the system changes. Okay, like when mom and dad get saved, it changes the system for the kids. All right? If some government leaders get saved, it changes the system for everybody. So it's not that the system can't change, but Jesus didn't die to save a system. Jesus died to save sinners. So you can't get all locked up about the system, although we want to change the system where we can. It's not that it's not, a, it's not important, but that's not a primary importance because the system is temporary and your sins are eternal. Who's going to handle them? You, the judgment of God in hell, or Jesus, freedom in heaven? This text is about deliverance. This text is about deliverance. You say, well, doesn't Jesus care at all about actual poverty or like, actual disease, or actual demon possession, he does. If you keep reading through the book of Luke, we're gonna talk about it. In fact, in this chapter, after he goes out of the synagogue, he goes down there and starts casting demons out of people, healing people. He meets people's physical needs. He does care, but all of those are temporary things that point to an eternal thing. Because everybody they healed, later on, they got sick and died of something else. But when Jesus saves someone from sin, blame, guilt, and shame, that's forever, baby, that's forever. That's forgiveness forever. It's so much better, so much more important. And Jesus is saying, I'm gonna do all the things that Isaiah's talking about. I will bring good news to the poor. I will bind up everybody's wounds. I will bind up the brokenhearted. I will usher in the year of Jubilee where all the debts are canceled, where all the slaves are set free, where all the inheritances are, are restored. I will do that one day. But today, I'm going ahead and setting sinners free from sin, blame, guilt, and shame. And the way to get there is you've gotta accept Jesus here. Which brings me to number four. Jesus is for everyone, everywhere. Jesus is for everyone, everywhere. Do you know why they wanted to kill him after he got done preaching? They didn't want to kill him because he was, they didn't really even want to kill him because they said he was the one Isaiah was prophesying about. They wanted to kill him because he said, I'm not just here for you, I'm here for everybody. I'm here for the people who aren't at synagogue today. In fact, I'm for people who aren't even Jewish. I'm for everybody, every nation, every tribe, every people group. I'm for every person from every neighborhood and every place and every language and every race. Jesus came to invite everyone to get rid of their sin, blame, guilt, and shame because they all have it. Where did he say that? Because I just read that whole thing with you, Pastor Jimmy. I didn't hear one word of that. What are you talking about? You gotta know the Bible. See, this is why knowing the Bible is so vital. Jesus tells, he mentions two Bible stories from the Old Testament. One of the Bible stories is about a guy named Elijah who was a prophet. And Elijah, when there was a famine, there was no rain, there was no food, Elijah, instead of bringing food to the king or bringing food to the religious leaders, he goes out in the sticks to this widow who's poor. And she just has a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And all she's gonna do is make one more loaf of bread for she and her son. And then that's gonna be the end of their food. That's gonna be the end of their supplies and they're gonna die. And Elijah goes out there and Elijah says, God sent me to you. If you will give me your oil and your flour and make some food for me today, God will see to it that you have all the food that you need. But you've got to take a step of faith. You've got to use 
your last supplies. Give them to the Lord. If you do that, he'll give you all the food you need. And you know what that little widow lady did? She, she just did it. What do I really have to lose? And God multiplies bread and she and her son live. And that's an insult to all the people who could have been fed all the places Elijah could have gone. But he went out to a nobody, some widow, some impoverished widow, and that's the one that he fed. Then 30 years later, Elisha comes on the scene. Same kind of thing happens. There's all these lepers in Israel. People are eating up with this disease of leprosy. It's a horrible disease. It rots your flesh. It's horrible. And there's this Syrian who's not even a God person. He's not, even, not a believer, just a Syrian. But he hears that there's a prophet in Israel and he thinks, I'm gonna die of leprosy if somebody doesn't do something. So he just comes to Israel to try to get healing. He meets up with Elisha and Elisha goes, oh, you wanna get healed? And he gives him this prescription of things to do that are humiliating to him. Makes him wash, makes him take off all his clothes, all of his uniform, all the stuff that shows how important he is, makes him take all that stuff off. Makes him wash him. He says, if you'll do this, humble yourself in this way, God will heal you. It just so happens, Naaman, even though he really doesn't know God, he realizes he's eaten up with that disease and he just does what Elisha tells him. And sure enough, God heals him. And Jesus is saying, I haven't just come for the people who are in the house. I've come for the people who haven't made it into the house yet. I've not just come for the people who are believers right now. I've come for the people who don't know yet. In fact, I haven't come for the people you'd expect. I've come for the people who've been pushed down and pushed out by the religious people, by the world, by society. I've come to them. I'm going to the widow in the sticks. I'm going to the Syrian army officer. I'm coming to you. Those who've been pushed down and pushed out, eaten up by sin, blame, guilt, and shame. That's who Jesus came for. So they get mad. You know, sometimes people get mad today. Aren't you glad we serve Jesus who came for every person from every place? I mean, men, women, he came for both genders. He came for people no matter what color your skin is. He came for people no matter what nation their citizenship is in. He came for people no matter what their heart language is. He came for people no matter what their sexual orientation is or what their pronouns are in their bio. Jesus came for all of them. He came for all of them. And if anybody will come and repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they can lay down their sin, blame, guilt, and shame at the foot of the cross of Christ. They can receive new life in Jesus, just like Jesus was raised from the dead. And they can have it, and you can have it. And then after you receive Jesus, Jesus will change you. He'll start changing your habits. He'll change all kinds of things about you. But it starts. You're gonna carry your own sin, blame, guilt, and shame, because that'll take you straight to hell. Or you can give it to Jesus. He died for you. This day, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. My favorite part of the Entebbe story is at the end. Those planes take off. All the hostages are piled on there like cattle. They fly under the radar. They get back to the Tel Aviv airport. They land on that Tel Aviv airport. They let those tailgates down. And those hostages and those soldiers come flooding off the plane. And the tarmac out there is filled with family members and well-wishers and the Israeli people are all out there and they rush the plane and they embrace the hostages who were dead, but now they're alive. They were hostages, but now they're free. And they, they put the soldiers and the pilots on their shoulders and they sing and they dance and they rejoice. The pictures of them singing, dancing, rejoicing tell the tale. Why? Because these people were dead, but now they've been rescued and they're alive. And there's no better picture of the gospel that I can think of. That's who we are. We're not better than anybody else. We're just a bunch of beggars telling other beggars where we found the bread. We were dead and now we're alive. It is the grace of God, the amazing grace of God that has made that possible. Do you need to be rescued? Have you been carrying around that sin, blame, guilt, and shame? What if today you made a decision to turn away from your sins and yourself and just turn to Jesus on the cross. Turn to Jesus raised from the dead. And even if you're a Christian, 
It's possible you have still been carrying around your own sin, blame, guilt, and shame. You laid it at the cross one day, but you kind of picked it back up, and now you're just beating yourself up. You don't need to beat yourself up for something that Jesus has already been beaten for. You need to crucify yourself. He's already been crucified for you. You need to punish yourself. He's already paid the penalty for your sins. Why would you insult the sacrifice of Christ by saying, no, my sin's too heavy, my mistakes are too much, I gotta carry my own shame? That's a sin against God right there. Let him have it. He wants it. He came to deliver us from our sins. And every Sunday at Family Church, we do a ritual that celebrates the forgiveness we have in Jesus and that reminds us of the forgiveness and the deliverance we have in Jesus called the Lord's Supper. We're going to do that right now. The Lord's Supper represents, when we eat the bread, the body of Jesus Christ. We drink the cup, it represents the blood of Jesus Christ and it reminds us that we have been set free. If you've forgotten, remind yourself again, you're free. At Family Church, we know that the Lord's Supper is for believers in Christ. If you're here today and you're not a Christian yet, we don't encourage you to take the Lord's Supper. Why don't you wait until after you become a believer and then you can take the Lord's Supper with integrity. It'll mean something to you. We also believe and teach it's best for you to take the Lord's Supper after you've been baptized and after you've become a part of a neighborhood church. Now a lot of you say, well, this isn't my church. I'm here as a guest, I'm here for we understand that. If you are a believer in Christ and you would take the Lord's Supper at your church, then you take it with us today as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes all over the world. But right now we're going to sing, we're going to reflect. Let's make our hearts right, let's confess our sins. Let's reaffirm our commitment to Christ. Let's renew our faith that Christ has taken our sin, blame, guilt, and shame on himself. And then we'll eat and drink the Lord's Supper together. Thank you for worshiping with us at Family Church at Home. Right now, all in-person neighborhood churches are about to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a family meal for those who are baptized believers. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and would like to take the Lord's Supper, please check out a neighborhood church near you and plan your visit in person for next Sunday. If this is your very first time at Family Church at Home, scan the QR code and fill out our digital connect card. Someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We are here to help you connect to a neighborhood church near you to find community. So plan your visit for next Sunday. Have a great week, Family Church.